Hello, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. We are pleased to bring you this month's installment of 2021 E4C seminar series. This seminar series aims to intellectually develop the field of engineering for global development. We host new research institutions monthly to learn about their work, advancing the United Nations development goals. My name is Kemani Chege. I am a Kenyan journalist with an interest in reporting sciences and the link between sustainable development. I have spent some considerable time reporting on health, agriculture, environment, and how that relates to general sustainable development. I'm currently the inaugural editorial fellow at E4C Fellowship for the 2021 cohort. I'll be one of your moderators for today's seminar, along with Dr. Jesse Austin Brenneman. The seminar you are participating in today will be, will address the engineering education in Kenya and the career pathway of young graduates. Do we have enough engineering graduates to take on the social entrepreneurship scene? Do we have a critical mass of engineers that can boost South to South cooperation? We'll hear more from our panelists today. And we are joined by Dr. Kamau Gashige, the founding director of Gearbox, Dr. June Mandete, a lecturer at Kenyatta University. We also have Eric Okumu, an engineer at Opibus, a Kenya e-mobility company, and Emmanuel Kenyanjui, an engineer based in Nairobi and a 2021 E4C fellow. Welcome to you all. The seminar recording will be archived on our E4C site and our YouTube channel. Both those uh, URLs are listed in this, in this slide. Information on, on upcoming seminars is available also on the E4C site. E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming seminars directory. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C team at research at engineeringforchange.org. We also invite you to share your feedback at the end of the seminar to inform our strategy. If you're following us on Twitter today, uh, please join the conversation with the hashtag, hashtag E4C seminar series. This seminar series was launched by Dr. Jesse Austin Brenneman, who leads the ASME Engineering Global Development Research Committee and our co-moderator today. Dr. Jesse Austin Brenneman is an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan. He earned his PhD in mechanical engineering in 2014 from MIT. He also holds an SM in mechanical engineering and a BS in ocean engineering from MIT. He currently is the director of the Global Design Laboratory. The group focuses on developing design processes and support tools to help multidisciplinary design teams think at a system level when performing complex system design tasks. This includes investigating the best ways to incorporate system level interactions between stakeholders in emerging markets into design and decision making process. Jesse will be moderating the Q&A session within this seminar. Before we move on to our presenters, I would like to tell you more a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization, a digital platform and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member of E4C. The membership is free and provides access to news and thought readers, a prior art database of 1,000 essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also receive exclusive invitations to online and regional events and access to resources aligned to their interest. Learn more about our impact at by visiting our website, uh, www.engineeringforchange.org, stroke our impact. Our research work cuts across geographies and, sector and sectors to deliver an ecosystem view of technology for good. Original research is conducted by E4C fellows annually on behalf of our partners 
and sponsors and delivered as digestible reports with implementable insights. We invite you to visit our research page to explore our field insights, research collaborations, and review of the state of engineering for global development. If you, are research, if you have research questions or want to work with us on a research project as a research fellow, please contact us at research at engineeringforchange.org. We also want to invite you to our upcoming virtual salon with IEEE on October 27th about connectivity and access to the in the era of COVID-19. Also, don't forget Impact Engineered. You are invited to our annual event and to join us for illuminating speeches, interactive experiences, special launch, and a celebration of innovation on December 2nd. Registration is free on www.impactengineering.org. Now, I would like to take a moment to meet our audience. Please use the chat window, which is located in the bottom right of your screen, and just type your location. If the chat is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. I can see somebody is joining us from Brooklyn, New York, Taipei, Taiwan, Chicago, USA, Ann Harbor. Uh, we also have uh, somebody from Nairobi, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Virginia, West Lyot. Welcome you. Welcome you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Pakistan. Interesting. Thank you. A couple of additional instructions before we get started. You can use the chat window to share remarks during the seminar. And if you have technical questions, just send a private chat to engineering for change admin. If you are listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any troubles, try hitting stop and then start. You may also try to opening a Zoom app uh, in a different browser. During the seminar, please use the Q&A window located below the chat to type in your questions for presenter. Again, if you don't see it, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. We'll gather these questions to ask the presenters at the end of the seminar. You leave at least 10 minutes for Q&A, so be sure to send us your questions beforehand. Okay, now um, as our first presenter, I want to welcome Dr. Kamau Gashegi. Dr. Kamau Gashegi is the founding executive director of Gearbox Kenya, of Kenya's first open makerspace for rapid prototyping based in Nairobi. Gearbox provides a unique window into industry 4.0 capabilities to innovators in Kenya, and it offers incubation and acceleration services. Gashegi also co-founded the Africa Innovation Ecosystem Group, a company that focuses on creating and manufacturing real estate-based innovation centers of uh, varying scales. Before establishing Gearbox, he headed the University of Nairobi's Science and Technology Park, where he founded a, lab, a fab lab full of manufacturing and prototyping tools in 2009. He then built another lab at the Riluta Setrite, in an impoverished neighborhood in the city. Gashegi is a member of the Global Council of the Future of Production under the World Economic Forum and of the Consultative Advisory Group of the World Bank's uh, Partnership for Skills in the Applied Sciences, Engineering and Technology. Dr. Kamau, are we getting enough engineering graduates from our universities? Please uh, unmute your, your mic, uh, Dr. Kamal. Yes, th thank you very much, Kimani, for that introduction. It's a real pleasure to be uh, here to share my views on this important uh, topic. Um, so I'll be quite quick. What I'll do is I'll begin by uh, answering the question by saying really that when you want to know, when you think about how many engineers are required for an economy, um, it'll really depend on that economy's ability to absorb those in engineers into a useful, um, you, you know, useful work. Um, I'll, if you look at, if you Google the country in the world that has um, the most engineers, uh, it's, it's Jordan. And Jordan has the highest number of engineers per capita in the entire world. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, if you think about the economy of Jordan, it's not necessarily known uh, for, for how an industrialized it is. Uh, 
And so, you know, the, the, the answer to the question will, for me, depend very much on um, how these engineers can be uh, uh, sort of used within uh, the context of the country, Kenya. So I represent, um, as you heard, a company called Gearbox. There's also two um, nonprofit companies that we have that I'll be explaining a little bit about in a minute, but I'll begin by just giving a bit of a background. So in East Africa, we have uh, basic three countries in the East, East Africa, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania on the bottom left over there. And um, this, this slide really is to emphasize that over the last uh, 10 or so years, um, the, economy, the economies in this part of the world have become dominated by imports from China, and um, <clears throat> which account for about 22% uh, of all the uh, imports into the, into the region. And, um, and what's happened over the same period of time in a country like Kenya, which was the dominant player as far as manufacturing is concerned in the region, um, our uh, manufacturing as a percentage of GDP has dropped from about 13, 14% range down to less than 10% right now. And so this is really a function of the fact that we are uh, uh, importing more of what we need than manufacturing locally. And a lot of people agree that the basis of um, uh, a healthy economy should be that you can produce a good proportion of what you consume uh, from within your own borders. And so by that measure, we're not doing too well. And the kinds of people that are needed in order to make this happen are in large part engineers. Um, the, some of the work that, we, that I did while serving on the Global Future Council on uh, Advanced Manufacturing and Production at the World Economic Forum, I actually don't, don't serve anymore, my term uh, finished, but we were looking at country readiness for the fourth industrial revolution, and we all are aware that the world is going through this rapid change in terms of technologies, and uh, this uh, impacts every sphere of life, and most certainly um, manufacturing, and so in this process, we're, we're in this analysis, we look at a country, if you look at the, the slide there, it says structure of production on the left-hand side, and that's a snapshot of where the country, any country's economy is, and it's, it's, it's divided between the complexity, economic complexity in that country, which is a measure of the variety of things that you can make within that country competitively, and then the scale of the market. And then on the right, you have these tools that drive us for production, and there's technology and innovation, human capital, global trade and investment, and all of these are what a policymaker in any given country would have as tools to try to expand that structure of production and be prepared for the fourth industrial revolution. And so what we're speaking about in this topic is human capital. But if the human capital, like the example from Jordan is such that uh, it isn't able to engage what it can do uh, adequately because of other factors, then we must be aware as we discussed this, this that there's more to it than the number of engineers or even the quality of engineers that you have in terms of the impact that you might have on the economy. And so for Kenya, we're looking at the complexity, that factor that I spoke of in terms of uh, uh, how much you actually produce in the country. And our biggest exports are tea, is at about 18%, cut flowers, refined petroleum, uh, you're looking at coffee, tropical fruits. And these, um, if you look at uh, this, this, this figure here, which is called the product and uh, space analysis, um, the dark area in the middle of this image is where uh, you, you have the greatest connectivity between different types of uh, products and then then and the and the uh, basis that you have within your economy to produce those products if you're in that zone that's dark that that means that as a policymaker, you should be pushing those particular areas so that you can have the growth that you need. And those those air, those particular exports that I mentioned, if you look on, on the periphery, you can see tea, you can see coffee, refined uh, petroleum, cut flowers, all the things that are the major exports from Kenya are not within the zone at all. So it means that um, uh, the, the interconnectedness around our main revenue earners are not sufficiently there. And this typically translates into the fact that engineers that we have in the country are really not able as as able as they should be to engage in production to be to be actively using their engineering for production so i taught engineering for many years uh, here in kenya and i found that a lot of the graduates um, that were coming out of the university of nairobi where i taught were actually going into auditing and they were going into banking and and, and areas 
outside of what they were trained to do. And really, you can't blame them because they, they basically have to be able to get out there and earn a living. And very often, a typical student will have a lot of dependents uh, that they need to be able to take, take care of as well. So they go to where they can earn the best. And so these are some of the challenges that we have. So uh, I'm sure we're going to get into this uh, further. I'll just very briefly uh, show a short video of uh, what we do at Gearbox so that uh, those who are here can actually get a sense. In Gearbox, we have a platform where we make it possible um, for people who have ideas to come and use equipment that they otherwise probably wouldn't have access to. And they can do this on a membership basis. It works a little bit like a gym where you get a membership and then you come in and use the equipment. And we also are, are, are there for people to actually consult contractors to make things. So we have a variety of machines. The laser cutter you saw, we have this mill uh, that is able to mill uh, uh, metal, is able to mill plastics, it's old as well. Also, there's a variety of uh, parts that you can make using a machine like this. Of course, 3D printing is something that you, you cannot miss when you're trying to uh, do rapid prototyping and be able to get a, a good prototype made in a short time, which is a very important part in the uh, prototyping process in engineering. Um, we also are very cognizant of the, the importance of electronics. And so we have a setup so we can do circuitry and uh, you can make a one-off circuit quite easily, quickly um, uh, within our, our center uh, for, for the purposes. And there's a robotic pick in place that goes along with that, as you can see in this image. And this, this does about um, 10,000 uh, components per hour. Uh, but it's really quite small but we've been able to use it like in the interest of this particular circuit to make like 50 devices to go out there and test in the marketplace we also make machines so this is a cnc plasma cutter that we made quite recently for uh, a center in uh, at the coast of kenya for the red cross uh, and we have at least 10 engineers right now who each independently can, can do this and you know you have to get an army of people who can make these machines to make an impact on the economy and uh, this is um, my head of engineering his name is william maluki and he's making a pipe and uh, an automated pipe bender he's doing this in silicon valley uh, we, we we work with uh, autodesk and he was then able to come here and, uh, and start a company that makes those machines that's a rotor motor that makes uh, water tanks uh, you know you put the plastic in powder form into into this mold that is shaped like a tank it's metal and then the flames melt it and as it rotates and tilts back and forth you get the internal um, walls coated with this plastic to get the, um, the tank this is a new capacity that we have we're going from just being able to prototype to actually do manufacturing it's a joint venture with a company from the uk called europe and now we're able to make circuits um in, in, in a scale and so we're, we're really leveraging the fact that iot is a growing sector and of course as part of um, the fourth industrial revolution we see this as a very important thing to be able to provide for i'm coming to the end of my uh, introduction this is just a project that we've been doing that is um for for job of job creation um is, is greenhouses hydroponic farming and we're looking with the mastercard foundation and the kenya commercial bank foundation to be able to create jobs and the engineers make all the bits and pieces um the bending the the, the metal for the greenhouses making the water tanks the sensors for uh, uh, sensing humidity and temperature and these frames that you can see here where the plants are actually uh, grown and and uh, uh, this this uh, the model here is that we the partners uh, find the market for the youth and uh, we're able to get uh, engineers to actually design and make and sell us machines that we require and we're hoping that this model going forward is something that can be applied not just to universities across Kenya and even other countries in Africa, but also some of the intermediate type uh, uh, institutions like TVET, TVET's, uh, the vocational colleges, the polytechnics and that sort of thing. So I think as far as um, introduction, I think I'll stop there and allow um, uh, others to, 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 to have their presentations as well. Thanks very much, Kimani, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kamau, uh, for those uh, captivating uh, comments and views. Uh, I hope uh, we can be able to uh, get more insight when we get to the uh, to the uh, when we start moderating the the panel. Now we turn to Dr. June Madete. Dr. June Madete is a biomechanics engineer, researcher, and senior lecturer at Kenyatta University, with special interest and expertise in motion analysis, software, and hardware. Her research involves applying the knowledge of clinical motion 
and analysis techniques she gained in the UK to advance biomechanical adoption in sub-Sahara Africa. She's the coordinator of the African Biomedical Engineering Consortium that seeks to develop and market the biomedical engineering profession within Kenya through knowledge and skill transfer with students, lecturers, scientists, and the industry across various sets in Africa. She has mentored numerous students on biodesign via the Ubora uh, virtual platform for the co-design of OSMDs, guiding device and developers towards compliance with the uh, international recognized quality standards and regulation for safety and efficacy. So uh, Dr. June Madete, how would you describe the engineering education and the process of building graduates in Kenyan universities? And what needs to change? Second. Yeah, we forget to mute. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I'm going to see how I'll relate to Dr. Kamau's presentation, which was excellent. He's left uh, the education sector and he's come and he's trying to do a very important task of creating that, that market Thanks so much. So when I start my presentation, my name is June Madete. As you heard, I, I've been a lecturer for a while, biomechanics. But when I came to the country, I realized that uh, biomechanics was advanced. So we needed to teach our students something more. And that's when uh, we started focusing on um, uh, uh, machine design uh, in teaching. What my goal is, is to introduce machine design from the beginning. And that's what I've noticed is making a difference in our departments. Kenyatta University, uh, where I'm from, you're very welcome. And uh, we have six departments where we do electrical engineering, uh, biomedical engineering, mechanical engineering, biosystems, energy technology, petroleum engineering, civil engineering, and computer information technology. Um, how are we preparing our students? So the first step we always do is to make sure our courses are accredited for the market. And the biggest stakeholder in Kenya is the engineer, Engineers Board of Kenya. And this, our courses need to be accredited for the students graduating to be able to enter the workforce and be able to be registered as engineers and to be mentored through their professional development. So Engineer Board of Kenya, uh, is required, you have to be, get registered by them in order to practice engineering in the country. And this is a requirement by the law. So we have to make sure the courses we are teaching are accredited by the Engineer Board of Kenya, otherwise our students are not going to be prepared. Um, there are different categories of registration. There's graduate engineer, professional engineer, but we can go into that if I get a question. Another way we are preparing these students is for by uh, making sure our curriculums satisfy the Commission for University in Education. And that's a, a body that was uh, developed by a Universities Act in the country. And any, they, they make sure they do the inspection, the monitoring and evaluation of our universities. On top of this, so the two of them combine and make sure we have the right like, uh, staff ratio, make sure we have the right laboratories, make sure we have the right um, uh, 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 essentially the best training we can. So another thing maybe I'd mention in, in, in Kenya, we our engineering courses are five years. And another thing that is very important that I normally find very passionate is that we have the, the accreditation process always ensures that all our engineers go for attachments. So from the time they finish their second year, they go for attachment for three months. After, at the end of third year, they go for another attachment for three months. And at the end of fourth year, they go for attachment for another three months. So another uh, aspect maybe that we try and incorporate is the aspect of design. And I've been lecturing at the university for about seven years. So I've seen two groups graduate. And the most promising graduating class was the one that just completed because they had a whole almost 12 months at home. So they came to us and they were like, okay, you teach us design, you teach us design. How can you help us? Uh, we've designed things. How can we prototype uh, without having to think about the cost? So our, our university was very generous and assisted. And we realized that yes, the design training has actually impacted our students. And just to mention a few, they developed a, a, a mechanical ventilator uh, in the past year. They also have uh, developed a prototype uh, satellite box. It's not very clear there, but that's another aspect. And then we have 
the students here are showing that um, you know uh, the mechanical ventilator, the, the swabs that are also developed at the university. So we are seeing the fruits of including design aspects in every avenue of the uh, curriculum, and this is something we would like to incorporate more, uh, not just for uh, you know, like for example, myself, I include it in my machine design. So it doesn't mean that it's in the curriculum. So the next step is to modify our curriculum so that we meet these students and cater for that need for innovation and move forward from that. And maybe, uh, okay, I think my slide has a, so thinking every single aspect of design so that by the time you graduate, you can be able to go and talk to Gearbox and be able to say, I have this idea, how can you help me? Um, without actually going for auditing, uh, I hear you, Dr. Uh, Kamau, they always go for the auditing aspect and sometimes it's painful when you've trained them for five years and then they're in a bank. So we are trying to change them as they graduate, not only emphasizing, for, for example, two years ago, not all uh, engineering courses in the country were accredited. So that means even if they graduate after five years, even when they're trying to be mentors as, a, as an engineer, they're not getting there. So we're trying to make sure we are getting it from the beginning and getting it right. So if there's not any other questions for us at, at Kenyatta University, from the beginning, we want to make sure that we are training these students for every aspect, not only innovation, not only design, not only thinking outside the box and trying to change the market, but also making sure that in the terms of policy and for example, the Commission for University Education and for Engineers Board of Kenya, we tag them along. If there's anything we need to change, we make sure we talk to them. So that's how we prepare them for the market. Uh, I'll leave it there for now, uh, in, unless there's any question. Um, yeah, thank you, Kimani. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. June. And uh, we hope the students who are joining us can relate to the uh, changes that are happening in, our, in, the, in, in the curriculum and um, in the local universities. If you have any questions, please remember to include them in the Q&A section to be considered for this section later in, the, in today's seminar. Now, from a perspective of an engineering graduate uh, and their journey to employment, I want to welcome Eric Okumu. Eric Okumu is an electric vehicle research and development uh, engineer at OPIBUS, an electric mobility company based in Kenya. OPIBUS vision is to make electric transport more accessible to a broader market by making the technology more cost-effective and simplifying develop deployment. The company focuses on all electric conversion kits for fleet vehicles such as uh, light trucks, public transport, or matatus as we call them here in Kenya, and buses, as well as all electric uh, motorcycles and energy system. Eric received a bachelor's of engineering degree in electrical and electronics in 2018 from Technical University of Kenya. After graduating, he has spent the last three years of his professional experience in electric vehicles field, in electric vehicles field specializing in electrified powertrain concept in areas such as uh, motors, inventor, battery, management systems, DC, DC converters, onboard chargers, and battery packs. So uh, Eric, what was your experience transitioning from engineering school to the job market? Okay. Well, my experience, um, actually my experience was uh, good because I actually was picked right away from the university by one by the company they had some linkages with one of our professors so actually my transition was not that hard but i'll just try and just highlight some of the areas where uh, maybe my fellow graduates are facing challenges just trying to just trying to help each help us know some of the challenges that some of our graduates are facing as they enter the job market here in Kenya. I bet this maybe might apply to some uh, of the countries which are represented here, or maybe it might be better in other areas, but I would say that uh, the journey has been well. I, first of all, maybe as an introduction, I work for Opibus uh, for the last three years as a, a 
as has been as as it has been mentioned, and uh, I'll, it has been a great experience, being that it's um, a very new uh, area in in technology that is happening everywhere. There is new stuff that are happening, and yeah, it's been a great experience and a great moment to be in that company up to now. I just uh, just dwell in in some of the challenges that uh, graduates are facing uh, that are maybe making them not be ready for the market. Um, I think my previous speakers have mentioned some of the areas that maybe would um, try to reinforce this and or try to uh, put more input into this, uh, into my into my areas of discussions today. So are any engineers ready for the job market? Uh, looking at the numbers, we have at least 2,000 professional engineers. I think those who have spent at least three years as registered graduate engineers and being mentored by somebody. Then we see we have almost 15,000 registered graduate engineers. Those are those who have maybe just transitioned from university and they're just finding their way into the field. And yeah, and we have almost 30,000 graduate engineers who either are have maybe have moved into other careers or maybe they've not had an opportunity to practice engineering. So these are these are the people maybe who are facing these challenges that maybe I'm going to just address and highlight as as we as we try to decipher them more. So I think one of the things over the, my time at the university, some of the areas that I found that were a bit uh, uh, dragging our engineering in field here in Kenya is maybe a shortage of teaching professions. I remember we used to share lecturers from almost five universities. Some could travel all the way from Eldora, which is around 150 kilometers just to come and lecture us. And you could find them straying. Sometimes we had to like have like two lectures in a week. And sometimes we even miss just because we, uh, we are lacking that uh, uh, that expertise. But nevertheless, we at least we over the years I've seen the time I was in campus, we've seen more and more uh, lecturers from different fields, even from uh, abroad, just coming to uh, reinforce that. And uh, sometimes we find we have outdated syllabus and equipment. Sometimes you could uh, get us trying to program microcontrollers from 1990s, <laughs> and yet we are almost in the new era. I think one of the reasons could be maybe the people responsible, but then they had not yet updated themselves with the current technology. So I think that has been uh, an issue, but also just a positive thing towards that we've seen new equipments, like from the university I was in, which is technical university, we had some uh, CNC, some one of the most advanced CNC machines in, in, the, in East Africa being brought by the Chinese government. And they've really helped so much in impacting the skills to the, to the students. Also, there's, there has been some lack of emphasis, emphasis on research and skills. Sometimes we, I remember back in campus, we could, it could be just about the grades and not what, what you are going to get out of it. So I think that was an, another area that maybe we needed need to look into as the engineering fraternity here in Kenya, just to have more emphasis on research and skills because we found that most of the university in other areas uh, the most of the projects, most of the uh, startups develop from the universities. And it's also good to say that even in, here in Kenya, there are some, some students who have, uh, have established campus directly from the universities. So that's a key area that we really need, need to look into. Okay, there has been also emphasis so much on employment instead of entrepreneurship. Uh, most of the graduate engineers have in mind that they always look into the best places to work to, maybe the big companies like here in Kenya, most of the most of our, after companies is like the Kenjen and the Kenya Power and Lighting and these manufacturing big companies, but there's not so much emphasis on self-employment, which could really bridge the gap between, uh, which could bridge the gap for the un unemployed graduates in Kenya. 
Yeah, uh, another area is inexperienced graduates. Yeah, most, uh, you find most companies usually prefer people who've been in the market already so that they don't spend much more time on training and uh, yeah, and maybe time. So I think that's something that uh, has made most of graduates not have jobs. Yeah, another area I would say there have been few platforms to showcase innovation. Maybe I would like to thank maybe uh, Dr. Kamau from Gearbox. I think their firm has really provided so much, uh, have tried to bridge this gap. I remember participating in one of the hackathons and I got a scholarship just to go and study embedded systems in Gearbox. So at least such platforms really provide us with opportunities to showcase our talents for people to to see us, to see the graduates, and so that maybe they can secure employment. Another area is just poor networking skills. Yeah, most professionals, most graduates here don't join professional organizations like IEEE, EBK, and, and they even don't have like active LinkedIn accounts to just uh, link up with professionals who could share opportunities with them. I think that's one other thing. And also little or not drive, little to no self-driving, uh, just trying to, because uh, you find the industry is changing so fast and graduates really need to uh, keep abreast with the new technology. So that's one other thing that has really made our engineers not to uh, be suitable for the job market. Yeah, another, in, onto my last slide, um inclination on expatriates yeah you find that most companies uh, are preferring uh, maybe expatriates to handle projects sometimes maybe like maybe like uh, just as a picture illustrated, we have the expressway most of the engineers you find there are from china so you don't find like most of our indigenous engineers being part of those projects because probably the, the machines that they are handling are beyond their scope or maybe they've not had a chance to interact with them so those are some of the areas that maybe our we could try to breed to help graduates maybe get employment another bottleneck this has been a really big bottleneck for some of engineers the ebk just as madame june has said we've had it's really sometimes really funny because you are you get uh, you get uh, selected by a government body to join a a government university just to be told you are not qualified by another government institution which is bit the irony in it so i think the bureaucracy sometimes it's there but uh, luckily some of this has been addressed some of the courses have been accredited and just as madame june said i think it's good to just have a platform where all these issues are addressed and so that the student doesn't suffer at the end of the day the last thing is lack of mentorship from industry individuals yeah most of us, I, for me, I personally wish I had somebody to mentor me before I transitioned out of the university, but I would have there some things I would have really done better. Maybe I would have invested more time in doing some things. Yeah, because I, I think the dark black box that exists among the graduates where we don't know where we are going into, we don't know what awaits us in the field. So I think there's, a, there's real value in mentorship for our engineering graduates. Yeah, thank you so much for my presentation. Really appreciate it. Yeah, that's, that picture is of open bus, what we, we do. We do retrofitting our diesel vehicles to electric. Uh, and it's uh, really glad to be part of changing the way, uh, just trying to make our world sustainable. Yeah. Thank you so much. And yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you, uh, Eric, for uh, sharing uh, your experience as well as um, uh, telling us uh, or giving us insights on what your peers go through after graduating and uh, the things that maybe they can do to make it better. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm sure some engineering graduates uh, joining us today can relate to this journey. And now, uh, last but not least, our very own Emmanuel Kenyajui, an E4C fellow. Uh, Kenyanjui is an engineer based in Nairobi, here in Kenya. He graduated from uh, Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology with a Bachelor's of Science in Mechatronic Engineering. He presently works as a software engineer 
working on building products, services, and experiences that empower the society. As a 2021 E4C Fellow, Emmanuel has been working with Kickstart International to support the improvement of uh, Impeller uh, design for solar irrigation pumps to be used by small scale uh, farmers in this region. Uh, Kenyanjui, how can uh, engineering graduates from Kenya work at the international level? Cross border collaboration or something like that? You just completed an international fellowship with the E4C, and uh, you can tell us how that one has uh, helped that aspect of international. Uh, engineers working at the international level. So, um, yeah, thanks, Kimani. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, yeah, uh, as, as Kimani has mentioned, my name is Iman Um I just concluded a few uh, weeks ago. Um, and yeah, uh, maybe to answer your question. Um, so just a second. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll answer that question in um, as I'm completing this, but uh, that's who I am. Um, I studied uh, BSc Mechatronic Engineering in JPWAT uh, class of 2018. Um, and maybe the highlight of uh, me as a student, because what I've really appreciated about it is um, everything that um, has been mentioned by all the panelists is something that I faced personally um, as a student. Um, so highlight of that was um, um, that year Autodesk held uh, um, what they call the Design Next Africa Challenge, which was um, across the entire Africa. And uh, the project that me and my partners did um, got to win the first prize for product design, which um, in the sense is we do have the capacity um, as engineers in Kenya to actually deliver um, world-class results because this was a first, uh, this was the one of a kind uh, competition across all of Africa. And um, yeah, it was out of, uh, I think, both architecture and engineering that uh, um, engineers, uh, we as engineering students in Kenya got to win that. Um, yeah, I work as a software engineer, so I'm one of the statistics that has been mentioned by um, Dr. Kamau, um, Dr. Madete, and um, Eric um, uh, regarding um, engineers actually leaving the space. But I believe there is more potential for us to actually provide quality work um, around that. Um, yeah, <clears throat> for this particular year, I worked with Kickstart International on um, a data processing and visualization project, water pumps. Um, it has been mentioned. And for that particular um, time, um, sorry, we got to um, build out um, what we'd call uh, <clears throat> leveraging on IoT. So we had um, some hardware devices that uh, Kickstart used to use for um, monitoring pumps in the field. So Kickstart International is a company that uh, builds out pumps and they lend them out to farmers in the field. And out of that, um, they normally collect some logs out of those um, devices. They leverage um, having them on SMS. So have the devices send an SMS to the base station in Nairobi. But sorry, um, out of it, um, they take a lot of time to sift through the information um, and actually make sense out of it. So this would all happen on an Excel file. But uh, coming into the fellowship, um, we proposed leveraging on IoT so they'd be able to use the same devices they're having in the field, but now send data over um, <clears throat> the internet and um, actually visualize this um, in real time. So we were able to do this uh, using our custom web application and um, just some few tweaks here and there on the um, hardware devices. And <clears throat> all this was made possible by the fact that uh, as an engineering student, um, as Dr. Madete had, um, <clears throat> Had mentioned, um, we get to we get the chance to go into the field for I think um, that's almost um, three times. So that's in your second day you go for internship, third you go for internship, fourth you go into internship. Um, but this has also now been um, <clears throat> reinforced in the sense with by the fact that now we have more practical um, places to go interning at. One of these places I mentioned maybe is Gearbox, um, going into companies where um, they actually support uh, real real um, real life experience. Um, and personally to me, um, that really helped a lot, um, actually even be able to achieve what we're able to do with Kickstart, being able to achieve what I was able to, uh, my team and I were able to achieve um, for our final year project as students, because um, we're getting to a point where as much as that has not been the case where academia, industry and government collaborate to create an enabling environment for engineering students to thrive. And that is slowly taking shape with such initiatives as what uh, Dr. Kamau is doing at Gearbox and um, changing of curricula by what um, 
Kenyatta University has, has mentioned, maybe they're doing to actually make it uh, more advanced uh, and more relevant to what we're doing. And uh, yeah, just you yourself creating that, um, <clears throat> getting that extra initiative to uh, jump onto these opportunities and present your best foot forward um, to actually achieve what you want to do. Um, yeah, that's uh, as much as I had for this presentation. Um, back to you, Kimani. Thank you, thank you, uh, Kenyanjui, for um, giving us that uh, insight. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud to know that some of those things are working just beyond Kenya and can be uh, adopted across the, uh, maybe even the African continent and beyond. Thank you for that. And now we get into uh, our moderated uh, session where I will be asking the panelists to shed more light uh, on the topic of the day. And I think I want to start with uh, Dr. Kamau. A makerspace can sometimes have sk uh, sk skills people with uh, and skilled pe skilled people who have probably no degree but just talent. There are also people with uh, maybe a, a diploma in, in in some of the areas and with hands-on experience. How do these people compare to university graduates probably that you have worked with? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. So broadly speaking. Um, you know, uh, the university experience as both of the young engineers uh, in their very excellent uh, presentations, Eric and Emmanuel, have explained um, that there tends to be, and this is true in many African con countries, uh, a sort of a, a, um, overemphasis on theoretical exposure. Uh, June mentioned that the, the degree program is actually five years. Uh, that's after 12 years of schooling. And in many countries that are very advanced and, and seem to be able to um, to 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 to, uh, to supply enough engineers for their industries, they have four year programs, uh, and some even have three year programs. And yet, the engineers are able to plug in and do uh, what would appear to be a good job since their industries are doing well. So, um, we we tend to maybe overemphasize uh, the the theory, um, and I know quite a lot of engineers who will graduate and feel um uh a sense of uh, maybe imposter syndrome uh, I, I i have a first first class degree or whatever but uh, you know i i really don't feel the confidence in terms of being able to do stuff and you know there's no fault of their own um and and so um people who are um out there that you describe who you know have skills and maybe have not been ex very exposed to a formal education will obviously be be quite good at what they do, uh, especially if they're doing it every single day. Even though there may be um, certain things that they might have to 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 unlearn or or to learn in a different way. And in Kenya, I happen to be um, with the National Industrial Training Authority, and that's the authority that oversees training within the workplace in Kenya, not within the institutions. And I chair the board there. And we have what we call recognition of prior learning. And so there's such people can walk into any center. And then, um, you know, if they say, for example, they're a welder, and then the trainers will say, okay, here, weld, weld this or weld that, or, you know, if, if it's, um, you know, a MIG welding or electric arc welding or whatever, um, um, you know, oxyacetylene welding, and they're given a task and then they're evaluated. And then they can get certification. And we've just created an entire um, uh, um, scheme, at, scheme, scheme for, for, for what these certificates are. And the highest certification is equivalent to a postgraduate level currently, and that's Master Craftsman 4. And so you can have a person who's never, you know, been in any formal education, but has worked maybe 20 years, uh, taught how to weld by their, by their aunt or something. And, uh, and now come in here and they do a test and, uh, you know, they, they, they now have the equivalent of a, of a master's degree uh, you know, because of the test. So, so these are some of the ways that we'd like to be able to recognize that. Then at Gearbox, we also teach short courses. So we're, we're trying to step out of the, the, the typical uh, traditional mod, mod, model whereby you need to sort of start all the educational process through first principles. And I'm not knocking that. That's extremely important. The rigor is important. But sometimes people, just for whatever reason, Either they just haven't had the opportunity to to, to get those first principles, uh, or or perhaps it's somebody who does have even a degree but wants to learn something new because uh, there's such rapid change in in technologies in in in, in the marketplace, uh, and they don't want to go and learn all about this new area. They just want to be able to get some skills that be, they can use for themselves. And so we try to sort of tailor courses uh, to 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 feed that that sort of. Uh, 
uh, need. So um, I think there's ways of tackling it. Um, uh, and, and, and certainly any country should should really want to create all the mechanisms uh, possible to, to make their citizens better able to contribute to, to, to the uh, overall economy. And for this, we, we use the term national innovation system to, to speak about that where especially engineering related activity is concerned. You know, you, you have a time in Kenya where um, the, the first, almost well, the first person that I remember building an aircraft in Kenya who didn't have a formal education and the aircraft actually flew. And his misfortune was that he flew into a military complex, um, uh, you know, uh, compound. And so his reward was arrest. You know, he was arrested and put in jail <laughs> That's not a national innovation system. Uh, you know, what, what a national innovation system should be able to do is, is, in a sense, audit the population for talent where technology is concerned and so on, and then be able to help that person channel their effort and their energy to be able to polish or to learn what they need to, to be able to be more actively involved uh, uh, so that you're not just looking at the traditional uh, types of qualification, you're looking at what people can do, you're looking at aptitude, and particularly in countries where uh, so many people miss out on educational opportunities just because they can't afford it. And so that's where we're trying to move to. And uh, this is very important. Also, for policy, uh, for, from a policy perspective, uh, governments being able to recognize um, uh, some areas that uh, identify and then and then and then um, sort of very actively pursue educational opportunities that are not eight to five because people can very often not afford to not work. In other words, they, it's hand to mouth. So if you're going to teach them something new, it has to be after hours, perhaps, uh, and so on. And 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 so all of these are, are very important. So your your question, I think I've gone beyond what perhaps you are asking, but uh, I hope that 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 helps and allow, allow others to 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 uh, pitch in as well. It does. It does. Uh, and thank you, thank you for for that response, uh, Dr. Kamau. I, um, now I turn to Dr. Madete. Some education systems uh, around the world shape their curriculum according to national projects, goals, and uh, aspirations. So is engineering education in Kenya helping meet a certain national goal? For example, we can talk of uh, Kenya has the, the vision 2030. I don't know whether it may be and beyond. Uh, are we shaping our education system to, towards some of those uh, national goals? Um, thank you for the question. And uh, I think we are, and uh, because of the accreditation process, um, it took a long time for the accreditation process to stop being old school. I want to say old school. Um, it was what it was there before and nobody was changing it and it was what it is. So now I think they're trying to change it to fit that and including all the new vision 2030, for example, for Kenya and including them in their processes. So for example, uh, uh, biomedical engineering could never have been thought of any, like, okay, the traditional courses in engineering in Kenya are electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and civil engineering. So the new courses that like, for example, mechatronics was one of the first one to be recognized apart from the three core ones. Then you have biosystems, which was always there from the beginning, but it was rarely being accredited only I think one university had it accredited because they had a farm. So now they're like, okay, biosystems is more than just having, fixing a tractor, it's more than that. We have biomedical engineering. Many people don't understand it, but they, th they, they have embraced it. And actually the stakeholders are being asked to venture in and to, you know, like for example, if I talk to engineers world of Kenya and they say, uh, my, I, I studied telemedicine and I would like to be, and I am a bi biomedical engineer, they'll be like, no, telemedicine is IT. So it's that conversation. Now they are listening to that. They're listening to the fact that, okay, telemedicine is easy, part of engineering. They're listening to the fact that if I'm going to do aerospace engineering, there's different aspects of it that are different from the core, core engineers that are used to in Kenya. So I think with the vision, with the infrastructure, with how the world is going, and even like, for example, uh, seven years ago, they, didn't, they, they discredited all courses which had IT in the engineering, school of engineering system. Now they're like, oh, uh, everything has IT, so 
we need this back. So they are recognizing that and they're including that in the system. I'm just hoping Dr. Kama one day will do a three year course, but until then <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll stick to this one and try and make it better. Even if it's, in, you know, like for example, uh, the idea of five years was that they, they didn't do 12 years, they used to do 10 years. So you come and do the other two years, but when they added the 12 years before that, they didn't remove the others. So, okay, we have five years. How can we make these five years count uh, for now? Until now, we, we can change it to the shorter courses. So I think we are changing and we are being listened to. As a, I'm a biomedical engineer, and the first time I came here, they were like, we don't know what to do with you. But now they're like, I'm being called everywhere. Oh, come, we need this, we need that. So the government is definitely changing in the right direction. And uh, I, I, I am attached to that, so yes. Thank you, Dr. Madete, um, for, for, for your contribution. And uh, we agree with you. Many things are changing along the way. And um, yeah, uh, some years back, some of the courses that are being offered were not uh, had. So now I turn on to Eric uh, Okumu, and I will ask you maybe, uh, I don't think it was all that bad uh, at your university. And I'm sure there's a critical skill that you picked up that you have been, uh, that has been very helpful in your career so far? Yes, I, I think the biggest, uh, my biggest uh, skill that I took that has been really critical in my career life is uh, that uh, ability to research, because my work every day involves research and development. It's about uh, learning new things, finding how to do things the right way. So, I remember we used to be given lots of assignments and sometimes I, I'm one of those guys who didn't want like uh, people who maybe I, I try to see what others have done or maybe trying to wait for us to do that work so that I can maybe, uh, maybe just duplicate it and just hand it over. I, I, I was one of those people who was really, really self-driven. So, and just finding my way through the internet trying to find the right places, the right document, the right uh, information. I think that was one of my key uh, key take, take homes when I was in the university that really, has really helped me so much in my work today. And cause I, I, it's each and every day is, you have to uh, keep on finding the best way of doing something. Cause you, you always, in the workplace, you're always faced with an issue and you are maybe the last, uh, the last person to handle it you are, after everyone else has uh, maybe has reached a dead end you are the last person to come up with a solution so i think that was my uh, take home and uh, another thing is just that the, the desire to learn new things and that the self-drive as one of the people who in the university I could just try learn new software as matlab autocad from even i remember even doing some coding and stuff so I think through that, I have really inculcated that in my personal life, because uh, as you understand the immobility, um, the immobility field is quite new and there's no like uh, people with expertise here in Kenya probably. So you have to like go to the internet and try to find some courses just to be up to date with what is happening in the industry. And I think that has really helped me so much. I have, I have quite, I've done quite a number of courses online that have really helped uh, uh, shaped my career path in, in the immobility area. So that desire to be self-driven and, and also just net, maybe one last thing, uh, the desire, uh, the uh, just networking, that desire to network with people around me, I really, Especially LinkedIn, I use LinkedIn a lot and just a professional organization. I'm a member of IEEE Young Professional Society here in Kenya. So I get to link up with various members. I, uh, via LinkedIn, I get to attend uh, various webinars, conferences, just to, just to learn what's happening in the industry, what is, what is changing, what is uh, being implemented. So I think that, that, is just that self motivation, self drive uh, is one other key thing that I picked up from the university, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Eric, for, for that insight. I, I, I think uh, the, the, the discussion has been going on very well and it's very interesting for so many people, but I think we are running short of time. I 
kindly ask you to um, give us uh, another 15 minutes uh, so that we can uh, handle the, the questions. The questions are many, and I think based on the time that we have, uh, I'll bring in uh, Dr. Jesse to, hand in the, to handle the, the questions now. Yes, thank you, Kamani. And uh, I want to just thank the thank the panelists again for just really insightful, uh, both context and insight into the current state and the future of uh, engineering education, both in Kenya. And I think we have a lot of lessons for um, engineering education everywhere. I mean, I think we should all be trying to answer these questions and learn from each other in this way. Um, so I wanted, there's a lot of questions in the Q&A. If people uh, have some questions that they'd like to ask, um, please make sure that you can put it in there and you can you can see the uh, answers. May some some of them have already been typed there. But uh, just to synthesize, and I'm gonna try my best to synthesize in the time that that we have remaining here. Um, I want to talk about. Uh, I want to ask the panel in general about this balance between entrepreneurship and and getting just jobs in uh, growing the the industrial sector or the engineering job sector workforce in different ways. So for you guys, when we're thinking about uh, the, the number of stakeholders that we have here, and maybe I'll start with uh, Dr. Madete, how, how as an educator, how are we preparing people like balancing students that may want to go into entrepreneurship versus students that may want to just get a job or, or, or do something else. So how are you guys approaching sort of that balance in the education space? Uh, thanks, uh, Doc. Uh, that's a very good question. And it's been asked uh, actually recently over the past few years because it was not included in the curriculum, especially we have one course in third year for 35 hours in the whole five years on entrepreneurship and it's, general and it's not focused on innovation or prototyping or even like getting a patent for example so the idea is for the new uh, revised curriculum we include most many of that within the courses but at the moment we're encouraging them to go to places where they'll gain skills just as eric said and to you know venture out like for example my students i think uh dr kamau many of them have come to gearbox and uh, we encourage them to, to go to incubation centers or accelerators where they learn these skills. But as I have to say now, we, the, we have an incubation center at the university, which takes all students, not only engineering, and they get the skills there. But it's to encourage them to venture out. But the, I can say now for the revised curriculum, we've definitely included that because we're building on their design and their innovation. And without entrepreneurship, your design and innovation will be stuck in a cupboard somewhere. I always tell them that. And then I always encourage them to solve a problem that people want solved. So you can decide, oh, I'm very good at making a flying car, but are we ready for a flying car? But you can do a you know, no swab which will make you, you know, a business and, you know, it can be able to solve a problem that is needed. So it's just encouraging them not to, to solve a problem and always ask the questions. Engineers forget to ask the questions. And uh, so it's, um, we try and prepare that. Well, I try and prepare them and we are, one, we are incorporating that aspect in the curriculum for now. And I think even like the board, I know the board, the, the Engineers Board of Kenya, Whenever you take a course for them for accreditation, there are aspects they look for within that where there's innovation, there's design, there's entrepreneurship, and also uh, focal areas in the in the actual field. So they are trying as well to make sure that it's in included from the beginning. So from the time we train them from before they they, they I like what Eric said a black box. <laughs> So they just, we don't know what we're doing after we graduate. We want them to know what they're doing after they graduate. So uh, I'm. I'm, I'm really pushing for that, especially for biomedical engineering, especially for the courses that are being done at our department. And I'm sure that uh, once people see the benefit of that, it will be something that will happen often. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Mendete, for sharing that with us. Um, I want to ask a, another question, a great question here from uh, Paige Balcom, who's asking about sort of the bringing in the local culture and context into your practice as an engineer. Um, and I, I, you know, I think that we've had a number of conversations about this, but I wanna maybe direct this to, to, to Dr. Kachigi is to say, uh, how, how do we balance the sort of 
how can we, what is some of the advantages or uniqueness? How can we leverage the uniqueness of the Kenyan context to really sort of drive this innovation, right? So I think when we were talking earlier, you were talking about like, hey, here's some of the things that are both a challenge in terms of, you know, this is what our sector looks like. These are the products that we are good at making and exporting, and we have some sort of local advantage in doing so. And I'm wondering how you guys are, are matching that to the type of education, type of engineers that, that you guys are training, whether it's through short courses or, or in other ways. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so obviously, um, the, the, the difficulty, of course, is, is in, in having, like, and this is why a, 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 a center like Gearbox needs to have an R&D uh, arm in order to be able to sort of look at what's going on and respond to it adequately, because very often engineers are very busy engineering, but not necessarily, um, you know, uh, aware of what's happening uh, in the marketplace. So quite often the young guys are out to impress one another. Hey, I can do this. I saw it on the internet. I can do it better than I saw it on the internet. And two years later, you crack it, but the market couldn't care less. And so we're very interested in teaching human-centered design and uh, under, uh, so that people understand what the market wants and needs and, and, and direct their efforts towards that. And, and to answer your question, like we, we would be looking at, um, we, we have an opportunity right now at Gearbox to set up uh, centers um, that, that sort of straddle the space between an educational institution and the marketplace in some remote parts of the country. So there's a part of the country that the Kenyans are, will be very familiar and some of you, the rest of you as well, there's a, a place called Lodwa. And so they said to us, well, if we set up a center there, what are we gonna make in Lodwa? And so we said, well, you know, we, we need to research what's happening in Lodwa, you know, and you know what, 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 is, what is important to that particular local economy so that then we can tailor our intervention to what's happening there. So we know that there's a lot of camels and camel milk, there's, uh, there's honey, uh, there's, there's fish from uh, Lake, Lake, Lake Turkana. Uh, there's, there's so you know that kind of an approach is is what what is necessary, and that's why uh, the, you know you you cannot have an I, the, the solution really lies in a lot of interconnected effort from a lot of different uh, um, academic disciplines and so on. So uh, that that to me is is really the the way to do it, and the market has to drive it <clears throat> so that ultimately it makes sense. The other very important player in all of this is, is the government, of course. And the government, uh, like in Kenya, we, we have, there's one estimate that I heard and the, the, the government is responsible for 70% of the economy. So you know what the government in any country does, it, it, it pulls in lots of taxpayer money from all the citizens and then applies it in accordance with the wisdom of those leaders or, or the lack thereof. And so obviously in any country, the biggest uh, uh, player in the economy is the government. And so for us, we, we think it's extremely important to, 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 for the government in, in a country like ours uh, to say, well, we're going to source as much of what we need as possible locally. Okay, so we need say we need computers and uh, how, how far away are we from making computers uh, and, and is it worth putting effort uh, resources into uh, increasing that capacity versus maybe say textiles or, or you know because there's a limited amount of money that they, they can actually apply and so there has to be some very well researched uh, approach towards deciding where to place that effort and then of course when when they say we need textiles, then the, the 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 government, somebody in the government should go to the universities and say, what can you guys do to train people within textiles? What kind of programs do you have currently, and so on? And can we, um, you know, marshal some 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 effort, uh, resources, and and so on towards getting that capacity? And the reason is blah blah blah. So justified. So again, there isn't all the money. So you 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 need to be able to to focus on what's where the biggest uh, advantage is. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, there may be some, a lot of complexity in say, for example, designing an automated window winder for a car. Uh, but, you know, is that really going to help your economy versus uh, a, a, an effective way of assessing quality of milk, for example, because this is a percentage of the economy that relies on dairy farmers and, and, and so on. And this is how many jobs we can get if we are able to, 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 to do this better. Uh, and import substitution as a, as, a, as a sort of a policy directive that then filters down into, you know, the entire capacity within the economy to be able to substitute the, for those imports. 
Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kamal, for for sharing that with us. Um, you know, and I and I absolutely agree. I think that there's a you know this idea of you know really making sure that we're developing a workforce that works for our context. I think is just so important, and, I, and you know, I really thank both of you, uh, you know, Dr. Mathete and and Dr. Mel for sharing these types of pathways to try and do that. What should we be considering as we try and go and move forward and, and do exactly that? And I think we can generalize that to many, many different contexts, right? Like we should be thinking about that here in the United States as well as elsewhere. Um, I want to now ask uh, Eric a, a question, and and this is sort of, um, you know, I think that we've talked a lot about. But uh, we've talked about both sort of the university experience and credentialing there. We've talked about, you know, Gearbox, which is sort of this, this uh, intermediary space. But I think that one of the things that we know is that, you know, it's, it's almost like a lifelong practice, right? Like we're learning as we move throughout our careers, and especially as we, as engineers, as we specialize into different areas, we have sort of continued learning on the job training, right? And I wanted to ask you about your experience, but also your thoughts on, are there opportunities for improving sort of early to mid career types of opportunities, you know, whether that's programs like Gearbox or other types of opportunities through, through, through companies that, you know, other engineers, like if you were talking to another sort of, you know, engineer, Kenyan engineer that's just entering this, the workforce, what types of opportunities should they be looking for um, to expand their industrial experience and become, you know, become more experienced? So what are the skills that they should be looking for, basically? Okay, maybe just to mention, uh, maybe just to mention the context of OffiBus, I think we, we we started a partnership with NITA where we, um, where OpenBus, uh, their employees can just um, register with, can can do uh, courses from, NITA is the National Industrial Training Authority here in Kenya, where they offer different short courses just to improve uh, the various uh, specializations that one uh, has. So we, we've, we've had a partnership with them where we, we as, 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 the, as the employees of OpenBus can just walk in there and just do some of the courses there and at a subsidized cost just to to provide that uh, platform for us to have that career growth in in the areas that we have and uh, i think the other area is to invest in maybe on online platforms because this the internet is it's all i would say it's almost free because there is there is workspaces there is those places that you can do just go and just maybe pay a small amount of money and just have access to the internet. There is so much in the internet. And I think there's now too much to read in the internet for us. Cause and I think the, the problem is now just trying to sort what, 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 what adds value to you. So I think uh, most uh, as, as maybe graduates or people who are trying to navigate through their career path, it's really, important for them to keep an eye on those available opportunities that are there online because we just with the i think with the uh, with the advent of with with covid we we realized that we can almost do everything just at the comfort of our <laughs> of our homes and i mean we are almost that three people just attending a session and i think that's something we uh, we really need to tap into and also another thing i would mention is just as I mentioned earlier, join those professional organizations like uh, EBK and um, IEK, IEEE, I guess there are those points that you get uh, by attending those sessions. And I, I guess it's not always just about the points, it's about what the value that you get from being part of those, uh, those uh, sessions, because I've attended quite a number and I, I, they have been of really great impact in my career growth because I've really learned like sometimes you may take a long path before you you understand something, but by attending such sessions, you are able to be guided by people who've gone earlier in their career, in, in their careers, and they are able to help you navigate through that. So I guess, and also the idea of, of uh, just, um, 
partnering with the with the institutions i think that's something that uh, institutions really need to help uh, maybe people who are trying to navigate through their careers i think uh, through um, partnership with institution that we we get because um, i've seen uh, i've seen uh, institutions that that just get their money through research and i think that's one key area that needs to be embraced because with money for research you are able to uh dwell into a certain topic or a certain uh, area of concern that you feel need to be addressed in the engineering field and that i think we really help propagate um, individuals in their career paths as they navigate uh, their career paths in engineering. Yeah. So I. Okay. So that that's that's great, Eric. Um, and I think that uh, you know you've really pointed out some of the importance of like the institutions and supporting sort of early and mid career professionals and and sort of building those partnerships, whether it's through short courses or or in other ways. Um, but also the the opportunities that maybe we have to grow our networks outside of our local local areas using sort of the the magic like what we're doing right now right so so i'm talking to you and i'm learning lots of stuff so i'm building my knowledge um and so yeah the the internet has helped me today and i think that it, you know this is just a great example of what we're able to do um given the time uh, it's 115 i want to thank uh, all the panelists personally for the amount that i have learned uh, today about what is happening and i'm sorry that we couldn't get to, to everybody's questions but you know we are here as a network and we're going to continue this dialogue i want to turn it now uh, back over to kamani just to have a, a final word of of wrapping this up and and uh closing us out today so kamani thank you uh, thank you jesse for um moderating that uh, question and answers and uh, i think um, has been very helpful thank you all for uh very much for attending uh, this seminar this is all we could manage for the, uh, to accommodate with the time given. We, however, hope that this conversation can uh, continue beyond this forum. We we'll share some of the questions with the panel for further action and uh, response. For more questions, email us at uh, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And don't forget to become an E4C member to get uh, info on upcoming uh, webinars, seminars, and other events at uh, www.engineeringforchange.org. Uh, stroke sign up. Also, sign up for our annual event on December 2nd at uh, www.impactengineering.org. We look forward to seeing you in our future events. Bye bye, Kwaheri, Asante. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.